A suspect who stole thousands of dollars from a local tattoo shop is now paying the price. Tonight, the shop's owner is speaking out about how he's getting his business back up and running. Things are looking pretty even keel this week, but I will explain just what changed from last week to this week's forecast. And are the number of coronavirus cases going down? We have an update on the fourth student who was diagnosed with the coronavirus in Seattle. Our shop's been open in Spokane for nine years, and, you know, our alarms always scared them away, but the alarm didn't help this time. It's every business owner's worst nightmare. Thieves taking advantage of them, leaving them empty handed. That's exactly what happened. Someone stole about $8,000 of supplies from a local tattoo shop. Good evening. Thanks so much for staying up late with us tonight. I'm Tim Pham. Police now have that suspect in custody. Creme 2's Brandon Jones has more details on the arrest. The, uh, the way that they were able to catch him very quickly will uh will maybe make people think twice next time that they want to break into a tattoo shop. Early Friday morning, Jeremy's business was broken into and a man stole from his office suite that was on the seventh floor of a secure building downtown. The guy came away with things like the tools they use for tattoos, ink, and electronic equipment. After he filed a report with the Spokane Police Department, Jeremy shared footage of his security cameras to social media in hopes of finding out where his missing gear could be. Being a small business owner is hard enough um, theft is something that is very disheartening. Last night he got a call from SPD saying they found the man who hit his shop. It turns out that same person was caught by an officer while he was in the act of stealing a bicycle. And on him at the time was a backpack full of stolen items. And so the police were able to recover some of those machines. And once they're done with those in evidence, I'll be able to get them back and put them back into work. A few of those items were gear he used every day on his work. So now he's got a sense of relief. The only real thing that's a complete wash is the ink that was stolen. He says once that left the building, it was considered unsterile. As a small business owner, you go through a lot anyways all the time, so it's just another bump in the road that adds to your resilience and makes you push harder to work. Insurance will cover the rest of the items on return. Jeremy wants it known that shops like his have a huge outreach. He believes the amount of support over the last few days played a role in catching this person, and he's thankful for the work of the officers. From Spokane, Brandon Jones, Crim2 News. Some roads impacted by floodwaters are reopening in southeast Washington. Highway US-12 reopened according to the city of Walla Walla. There are no longer any road closures between Tucci Road and the Wallula Junction. According to the U.S. Army Corps, the Bennington Lake levels that near, that's near Mill Creek is continuing to decrease. Well, it's almost like night and day across the inland northwest because up here we're tracking some sunshine. Meteorologist Thomas Patrick now in the Weather Center to get you prepared for the work week. Thomas. It's nice to say that there's more sunshine than there is rain or snow for a week ahead, especially with the last couple weeks in the winter that we've had so far this year. So far, cloudy evening might be some patchy fog starting to develop in some areas. I think that's what's getting picked up on Doppler radar. That little bit of what looks like snow showers in North Idaho might actually be more so freezing fog than anything else, but I wouldn't be surprised if a couple snowflakes try to squeeze out of that. I take a peek at some visibilities where you see a lot of tens. That's pretty much unlimited visibility. So if there is any patchy fog, it could be in between some of our observation points or still yet to develop by tomorrow morning. But really the one thing you should know is we actually got a pretty normal week ahead of us. Normal temperatures, which means highs right around 40 degrees most days, but it will be below freezing tonight about 24 for tomorrow morning with a patchy fog or freezing fog to get us started. And uh, while it might not actually be as cold as we originally thought from last week, so I have to explain some differences in our forecast and what led to that change. We'll be doing that in just a few minutes here at our 11 o'clock broadcast. Well, a lot of big headlines on this Sunday. Let's get you up to speed with the stories you need to know in 60 seconds. The initiative 976 drama could come to an end in the next few days. A King County judge could rule as soon as this coming week on whether the voter approved car tab measure is constitutional. 2020 presidential candidate Mike Bloomberg opened his office in downtown Spokane. His campaign says it's to make sure voters in every corner of Washington state hear why he's, quote, the best candidate to beat Donald Trump in November. 
vape shops can now sell flavored products once again after a four-month ban by the State Board of Health. It could become more permanent. Right now, an amendment to State Senate Bill 6254 proposes allowing the sale of flavored vapor products in shops that only serve to those who are over 21 years old. Flavored vapor products would not be allowed to be sold in grocery stores or gas stations. On Tuesday, voters will decide on school levies in two separate districts. There are two levies for the East Valley School District. One is the capital levy. The other is the educational and operations levy. District leaders say the money would provide important safety and educational services to the school, including a new security officer. Meanwhile, leaders with the Central Valley School District are hoping to add another school resource officer to its school. The addition is part of an $11 million levy going up for a vote in the special election on Tuesday. The Central Valley School District currently has two school resource officers. They're stationed at specific schools in the area to help enforce school safety rules, but some situations can call them to other areas within the district. During the Central Valley shooting threat, security demands were heightened. District leaders are allotting about $100,000 from the proposed levy for a new security resource officer position. This includes the officer's salary and equipment for one year. Some of the wage disparity between uh, Washington and Idaho has really impacted us. We've had to uh, change some of our tactics, tactics and strategies. Well, just last month, Washington's minimum wage went up to $13.50 an hour. But while someone could be making minimum wage in, say, Liberty Lake, for example, a worker just miles away in state line Idaho could be making $7.25 an hour. That's Idaho's minimum wage. So does that mean there's a bevy of folks in Kootenai County making drastically less an hour than their Washington counterparts? Not necessarily. An Idaho economist with Idaho's Department of Labor points out that Idaho's unemployment rate is already low and a tight labor market by nature will drive up wages. In fact, he added that federal data showed only 11,000 workers at minimum wage across Idaho in 2018. But the temptation to go over the border is there. Northwest Specialty Hospital has seen two specific jobs impacted by higher wages in Washington. Housekeeping staff and certified nursing assistants, or CNAs for short. Their HR director says the hospital has seen employees migrating to Spokane Valley for work. To curb the turnover, the hospital upped housekeeping wages from 12 to 15 bucks an hour. As for CNAs, they usually start at 12 to 13 an hour. They realize that a difference of a dollar or two really can have an impact. All right, well, it was Hollywood's biggest night and it brought stunning performances and a few surprise wins. Thomas is going in on the popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have the next read. So this was, of course, the 92nd Academy Awards and it was a star-studded night, that's this, for sure. Yeah, it was, this was a great Oscars and it started with this. Rapper Eminem thrilled fans with his oh, performance so awesome. of Lose Yourself, which won an Oscar back in 2002. He wasn't there to accept the award, so this was 18 years in the making. 2002? 2002. Still a great song, though. <laughs> great Presenters song. Presenters Maya Rudolph and Kristen Wiig broke into a musical medley when they were presenting the award for best costume design, which was given to Little Women. And the Oscar goes to Joaquin Phoenix Joker. And Joker led the Oscar nominations with 11, including the takeaway for best actor by Joaquin Phoenix. Well, four-time nominee and now two-time winner Renee Zellweger won Best Actress for Judy. Brad Pitt took home his first Oscar by winning Best Supporting Actor for his role in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Laura Dern also received her first ever Academy Award, winning Best Supporting Actress. Hair Love won for Best Animated Short Film. And the producer and executive VP of Sony Animations for that film is the first African-American woman in that category to take home an Oscar. However, it was Parasite, the South Korean film that was the big winner of the night, taking home Best International Film, Best Picture, Best Original Screenplay, and the award for Best Director. Thank you so much. When I was young and studying cinema, there was a saying that I carved deep into my heart, which is the most personal is the most creative. <laughs> that quote was from uh, our great Martin Scorsese, so. <laughs> wow, congratulations to that cast and the crew. You know, that was one movie that I, one of them I didn't see this year, it's although I really wanted to. So I'll have to go back and watch it. A very historic moment too. I think a lot of people are gonna be like, 
Yeah, we need to see Parasite yeah, this year. Totally. Well, this is the first time in Oscar history that a foreign language film won Best Picture. Also, the Oscars red carpet, of course, of course. is fashion's <laughs> biggest runway of the season. The celebrities walk down the carpet lasts just a minute or two, but it takes weeks of work to make sure their look is flawless. Kenneth Barless works with celebrity stylists to create that Cinderella moment. You have to make sure that your color palette or your trend is on point because if you're off, then no celebrities will wear it, no publication will use it. Well, Variety contributing fashion editor Brooke Jaffe says red carpet moments do matter. From bright colors, the return of the 80s puffy sleeves to accessories, these are the trends consumers may soon shop. Probably not us, for, for the girls. For the girls and maybe the I celebrities. Think the guys just That's need for sure. A we just yeah. and a bow tie. <laughs> Only so many options for us. <laughs> Natalie Portman used her red carpet moment to subtly make a point. Her dwar cape was embroidered with the names of all female directors who weren't nominated for the Oscars. No women were among this year's Best Director nominees, and only five women have ever been nominated for the category. And Catherine Bigelow was the only one to win back in 2009's the Hurt Locker. Well, the start, well, you know, this was again such a big night and I think, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, I didn't see that movie or I have never heard of it. But now, the, now we know which ones to watch. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's always a good launching pad, but yeah, Par Parasite being such that's a stunner. Yeah, I don't think many moviegoers even go see international films. Right. So I think this is the barrier that's going to get a lot of people past that. Absolutely. Well, let us know what you think. Chime in on our Facebook page. We'll still ahead tonight on Creme 2 News at 11. The start of the U.S. presidential race kicked off in New Hampshire. When we come back, a look at President Trump's return to the campaign trail.